Okay. Been a very long time since I've done a video. Um, I guess I should do a video. This video I'm going to be comparing and just talking about the air units in Axis and Allies 1940. Um, just seeing what their pros are, what their cons are, where you should use them. I'm not an expert on anything like this, but I thought I'd make a video. Who knows? It'd be fun. A laser pointer on. It's not a real laser pointer, just what the computer has. This is a slideshow. So let's go into the next slide. To begin off, I'm going to show some basic statistics. So we have the different units, the fighter, the tactical bomber, and the strategic bomber. Additionally, on this side, I put on the two combined arms, the fighter tack and the tank tack. So right here we have the basic statistics that, of course, it says with the game, the cost of each unit, the movement value of each unit, and the attack and defense of each unit. What I also have put on is I've taken the attack value and I divided it by the cost of the unit. I did that for the defense and I did that for the attack and defense combined as well. So this is really telling you, I guess, what attack value gets for each dollar you spend or something like that. Basically how much power you're getting for your money's worth in combat. And you see that for just the standard units, uh, the best attack in value is the strategic bomber, which is easy to see because it attacks higher than the other units. But of course, the strategic bomber also has the worst defending cost. The attack is the worst than the fighter in all cases, so the fighter is always a better choice um, for attack and defense. And the total is the fighter plane. When we look at the combos, we see the combos just blow the individual units out of the water. You know, the fighter and attack combo is equal to the strategic bomber in this attacking value I've calculated here. And of course, defending, um, it is slightly worse than if you were to have two fighters defending, which makes sense because, I mean, technically, there is no combo when they're defending. When they're not defending, there isn't a combo. Um, and this is just saying if you had a fighter and attack and they happen to be in the same space defending. So, but I decided to put that in there anyways. And then the total. The tank and attack is really good for attacking. It attacks just as well as the fighter attack combo. But it costs way, way less because tanks are much cheaper than planes. And then that also means it has a better defending. Even though it has a lower actual defense when you add up the values, it's just bettering the cost so much that the um, defense is better than the fighter attack. So with that, I'm going to go into the next slide here. Uh, strategic bombing statistics. So we saw in the previous slide, I'm going to go back to the strategic bomber was really still the worst in this total cost just because of its awful defense. So, what the strategic bomber has that could theoretically make up for that is that it has strategic bombing rates. And so I did the statistics here. Assuming that on average you roll a 3.5 on your dice. You can't roll that, but on average you roll 3.5 on a dice. The strategic bomber, you of course add 2 onto that. So the average damage it's going to do each time is 5.5. Assuming that it does three strategic bombing raids before it gets shot down, that's an average of 16.5 damage a strategic bomber can do on their opponent, which does technically make up for the cost of the strategic bomber. Um, here's the max damage for the different uh, things it can bomb. The value on the left is the max damage, the value on the right is how much damage needs to be done before that um, thing does nothing. So if there's 10 damage on a major industrial complex, then the industrial complex can't do anything until it's repaired. So what this really means is that on average, a strategic bomber can basically almost max damage any of the minor industrial complexes, the naval bases, or any of the air bases. Um, 
and if you had four strategic bombers on average that can max damage a major. But as soon as there's defending planes, it gets a lot more complicated. Over here I have this table. This is the amount of AA fires to and the amount of fighters that are firing at a strategic bomber. So if we had one strategic bomber and it's gonna get shot a bunch of these times, what's the chance that it is destroyed? So of course if um any of there's always gonna be one shot against the strategic bomber. Just because everything has a built-in AA gun, so there's always going to be this one shot on the left for the AA fire. That has a 1-6 chance of hitting the bomber, so there's a 0.17% chance. Or, I, I round it up, it's like 0 0.1666 repeating, but so 0 0.17. If there's a defending fighter as well, then the chance it gets hit is 0 0.31, 0 0.42, 0 0.53. And this is also why I said if um, it's most likely on average can last through three rounds because you see um, it has about a 50% chance it goes through the uh, 50% chance it can survive three firing shots. You know, as soon as you, this is four firing shots in total, there's one plus three. So if you did three bombing raids each with no defending fighters, then, you know, your average is going to be three firing raids for 16.5 damage. Now, you can bring in escort fighters as the attacker to help it. If the escort fighters you bring in is more or equal to the amount of fighters that are defending, then it doesn't matter. That's this sort of blue triangle box here. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to change the odds because the AA gun is still going to fire against the bomber. Uh, one that is less, then it's going to try to... the Odds are gonna approach the 16.6. .6. So these odds, you know, as we bring in more and more fighters, they're gonna approach. So this was like 17.05, while we had 16.6 repeating. So it gets it gets better, but still, the it's really not great odds when there's um, that you're gonna survive a bomber when you have defending fighters, especially since the average is really only four more IPCs than the cost of the bomber. This green box that I've done green is really, the, my opinion, really the best time and really the only time you should do ooh, um, strategic bombing, right? If you go more to the right, if there's defending fighters, it's less worth it because the odds really rapidly go up. And of course, there's no point in bringing escort fighters since it's always gonna be the same value. So really, strategic bombing should only happen, in my opinion, uh, when you have one defending AA shot going against your bomber. Now, there's one other thing that might help to, that might impact which plane we want to get, and that is the range of the planes. So I've created a fictional example of range. Let's say, the Allies controlled Cannon, and the Germans controlled Germany 2.0, the Ruhrland, uh, Antwerp, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay, if we had an Ally fighter and Cannon, that's this blue line. It can travel, it can fly up to Antwerp, and then it can fly back. Not really much of a point to do that, because I mean, there's. When you're doing, you know, a turn one German Barbarossa, some people do that. There's like a battle they do like that. But usually there's not too much of a point of that. Strategic bombers can go three in. They can all get all the way up to the Rahur land. And maybe they strategic bomber factory or something there. That's, at least they have more of a reason than the fighter. And they can fly back. It doesn't matter if there's an air base in cannon because that gives them one additional movement. But it would cost them two to get into any further areas, unless that there was somewhere else not, that I don't have that they could have landed in. Now let's go. This is a fictional example. Let's say we're in the Pacific and the Americans control Shangri-La, this island in Sea Zone One Thousand. Oh, I just realized my number is off. Anyways, let's say over here the Japanese control this island in Double Caroline. So a strategic bomber. Shangri-La could fly 
up to 103, uh, 1003, I should say, and it could fly back to Shangri-La. Once again, if there was an airbase here, it wouldn't matter because it couldn't fly the additional space. Now, once we had a fighter on an aircraft carrier in C-Zone 1000, it could go 2 to 1003, and then 2 back. And if we could bring an aircraft carrier into C-Zone 105, then theoretically the fighter could fly all the way, or fighter or attack, could fly all the way to 1005 if there was an aircraft carrier in here, or an aircraft carrier moved into here. If there was a naval base here, of course, the aircraft carrier that's in 1000 could also move to 103, could move to 1004. And so really what we see is that um, in land, the strategic bomber is better and additionally has more reason to fly further inland. But in the ocean, a fighter and tank are way better. But let's say that this was a little bit of a different situation. Let's say that the Allies and the USA controlled most of this land. The Allies controlled Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Antwerp, and the Wahoo land. Uh, a fighter and cannon could fly all the way to Wahoo land. And if there was an air base in cannon, it could fly all the way to Germany 2.0, do an attack there, and land in Wahoo land. Meanwhile, a strategic bomber has way better range now because it could fly all the way to Germany 2.0 and land all the way back in Antwerp. And once again, if there was an airbase, it could fly all the way and get back to Milwaukee. And so, while well, before, they couldn't really fly that much. I mean, when they're right in the front line, um, they can fly a semi-okay distance. But when they're a bit farther from the front line, sure, they can't far fly further into enemy territory. But they have much greater range, of course, outside their own territories and can theoretically hit and protect a lot more areas. When you have both these islands controlled, of course, the strategic bomber can now finally fly all the way over to the double Caroline Islands. And so what we can sort of take away from these two examples is that basically uh, the fighters in the Pacific and ocean areas are better at range than strategic bombers due to the fact that they can land on aircraft carriers which are sort of movable landing locations. On the front line, strategic bombers do have the slight advantage in flying inland, and just in, in mainland in general, the strategic bombers have the advantage. So the ocean fighters and tanks have the advantage there. On the mainland, strategic bombers have the advantage in range, in terms of which has better, better use of their range. I'm going to talk a little bit about my opinions. I'm not an expert, not really that great at this game. I'm going to say, well, I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay at this game. Um, but looking at this data, here's some of my thoughts. Of course, the tank combo is the best combo there is. Best out of all the units. And another thing about combos is that they can take two hits, right? A regular unit can only take one hit. A uh, combo can take two hits. Of course, you no longer have a combo. Because the first hit nullifies the combo, but you have two units, basically. It's the best combo, but it only works for land. It only works for land. You can't use it in the ocean. Um, so in terms of what's good for ocean, the fighter combo is still the best. It's better than any individual units, still. So it's also still pretty good on land. Um, still pretty good on land, but it is the best combo for the sea. Bombing rates are sometimes good. Right, they're technically, on average, you cost the defender more money than you cost yourself as the attacker. Uh, but only under the right circumstances, as soon as there's like defending fighters and stuff like that, it gets really nasty and probably shouldn't do it. Um, strategic bombers are really hampered when attacking in the ocean. They don't have great range compared to the fighters and the tanks, but they do have really good range on land for attacks. So I'm going to leave you guys off with one last thing, which is going to be a fictional example of maybe how your nation should place their units. Let's say we had fictional, we were playing as Greater Great San Marino, and we were at war with the United Soviet Socialist Turkey and New Nambidia, okay? And uh, New Nambidia is on all these islands, and we have this land conflict here with the Union of Soviet Socialist Turkeys. 
these sort of explosions or, you know, or battles that are happening. So, of course, we have this land combat here against Un Union of Soviet Socialist Turkey. And so we would want our tanks and tanks to be near this combat since they're really good with um, this type of combat. And then additionally, let's say they had the Union of Social Soviet Turkey had some industrial centers here, so we would want strategic bombers near there to constantly attack those to do damage to the industry of the nation. Assuming there's no defending fighters there, if there's defending fighters there, of course, change of plans, but the strategic bombers at that point can then also participate, help out in all land battles as well. So these can also serve as a double purpose if they're placed near this front line. We are also going to want to have some strategic bombers sort of in the middle of Greater Great San Marino because they have such a great range. You know, if you imagine a giant circle coming around here, they can protect basically the entire nation from any threats the nation faces just due to their great range. So we want to have some also back here as well. And then here we have some nice island fighting. And so we want to have our fighters and tacks over in this ocean where they're really good at attacking here. That is going to be the end. That's, well, I guess my um, analysis, my opinions. Of course, I'm not an expert. If you guys have any thoughts, please, you know, well, feel free to leave a comment below. I would love to read them, you know. Um, love to learn more about the game, as I'm sure, you know, anyone here wants to learn more about this amazing game. I don't have a conclusion slide, so I'll just go back to the front slide and say that's the end. Okay, right. um, I don't have an outro either, so I'll see you whenever I decide to make another video. Bye.